The current spate of UFO stories, mummified alien bodies, and general brouhaha about extraterrestrials reminds me of my teenage youth and the golden era of ufology in the late 1970s. Uh, Dr. J. Allen Hynek, the Center for UFO Studies and the Mutual UFO Network, Project Blue Book, and Men in Black were all part of the cultural zeitgeist, if not the mainstream media. I was in my teens, often huddled, huddled in my bedroom on the cramped floor space between my makeshift drum set Rhodes piano, which we bought used, still had a cigarette burn on one of the keys, and a black velvet sofa bed. I mean, what can I say? It was the 70s. But I would sit there for hours reading and busily clipping stories from newspapers, categorizing and filing them using systems developed by academic study uh, for, by um, Heineck and uh, Jacques Vallée, both at Northwestern Illinois University at that time. Well, they developed this UFO schema, a nocturnal lights, radar, visual, daylight disks, and then what we're all familiar with now, close encounters of the first, second, and third kind. I've always found it logical to presume the universe is full of life, so I've never really had any trouble believing that some of these UFO, UAP sightings and experiences are real. Toward the end of the Air Force's Project Blue Book, Hynek, an advisor to the program, said that at least 13% of the reports were not explainable. Not that they were necessarily alien, they were just unexplainable. Well, Nearly half a century later, we've learned exponentially more about the physical composition and mechanics of the universe. We've watched decades of Star Trek, Stargate, and Star Wars, so the idea an advanced species might skip about the universe on their anti-gravity engine spacecraft navigating the fabric of space-time through wormholes is not only acceptable, but many of us believe is a reality just waiting for discovery. Back when I was studying in my teenage hangout pad, <clears throat> talking about aliens and UFOs in public was taboo. Yet, as long as humans have been telling stories, we've believed in extraterrestrials, whether we call them angels or Anunnaki. Like Mulder in the X-Files, we want to believe. There's nothing wrong with believing as long as we refine our beliefs to keep up with new facts. What is it that Paul says? When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. But we learn new things as we age, and any reasonable person adjusts their spirituality accordingly. There is never a spiritual master that I know of, Paul included, who says, hey, you've made it to spiritual enlightenment. Congratulations, you can stop practicing and learning now. Our shared human story is one of continuous exploration and experimentation. We've always adjusted our worldview based on the wisdom of our experience. It's silly to claim the Earth is flat when plenty of evidence proves it's a sphere. But flat earthers prove that people believe what they want to believe. And that's the problem with believing instead of learning. The human ability to believe and theorize affects every aspect of our lives. Changing our beliefs can be complicated, challenging, and painful, even when we're faced with incontrovertible evidence, especially if our belief is a notion that's been held so long it's become a tradition. We all balance reality on the precipice of belief. We believe things so we can function in a complicated and confusing world. We see people killing each other, stealing food, hoarding resources. We see the rich get richer, while most struggle to feed their families. We've seen these things for thousands and thousands of years. So, in a troubled world, we develop belief systems to cope and hope. For a time, we'll believe in a powerful, loving deity to save us from the evils around us. But eventually, after much spiritual work, we should come to see that we created those evils, so only we can save us. That understanding should change the way we view God and Jesus, too. There is nothing inherently wrong with believing things, with theorizing. In John 20, verse 29, Jesus encourages us to believe, but he cautions us against believing for the wrong reasons. Jesus replied, Do you believe because you see me? Happy are those who don't see 
and yet believe. In his second letter to the church in Corinth, the Las Vegas of the ancient world, Paul writes, So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. A sound belief system is grounded in reality. It leaves room for growth the way trees branch out for nourishment from both the sun and the soil. Healthy beliefs feed us with light and root us in the present. Good, flexible, evolving faith creates strong spiritual, emotional, physical, family, and community roots so that we're not merely spiritual navel gazers, but compelled in the community to help everyone develop into the higher consciousness required to unite us as humans. For the past 2,023 years, we've been learning about Jesus. We've been learning about his language and his era. Archaeology, anthropology, linguistics, history, and other disciplines teach us that many of our current beliefs about Jesus and his generation are entirely inaccurate. Learning that the Bible developed over thousands of years in a Semitic culture very different from our world helps us better understand Jesus. Accepting that humans wrote the Bible over thousands of years prevents us from bibliolatry. Realizing and teaching our congregations that Aramaic, not Hebrew, was the lingua franca of the era and Jesus' native tongue is tremendously helpful because so many of the biblical translations we read today are from Greek, which was poorly translated from Hebrew, which itself is an edited version of the Aramaic oral tradition. Christians need to read the Bible with an ear toward Aramaic's multi-layered mystical meanings. We better understand the Bible and its people today because of what we've literally dug up over the past two millennia. To ignore that data is sacrilegious. And yet, while discussing Aramaic translations of scripture on Facebook recently, some Christians posted that they believed the translations were made up. They'd never heard of Aramaic or that Jesus spoke Aramaic, even though they claimed to have been Christians all their lives. For so many of us, our faith hangs on a precipice of belief so fragile that we're afraid to entertain any idea that might push us over the edge. But haven't you ever heard of a leap of faith? As a spiritual sojourner, I have found it liberating to move beyond religion, adjusting what I believe with what we know. Science Notably, string theory has helped me believe more powerfully than ever in a God of unconditional and all-pervasive love. Our belief systems must be responsive to our current understanding of the cosmos. I recognize, of course, that the idea of a flexible religion is often as taboo as discussing UFOs and polite company once was. But since we've progressed to the point where we can finally have a mostly reasonable discussion about extraterrestrial or at least extra dimensional life, I'm hopeful we're also able now to have more sensible talks about God, about Jesus, religion, and the ultimate responsibility of humans to radically and unconditionally love one another, no matter what we believe. Amen. Question today, where are you holding on and where are you making a leap <clears throat> from your precipice of belief? Where are you holding on and where might you be making a leap from your precipice of belief? I'll send you into a few breakout rooms for...